Physical Gold Fund presents The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik. Insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance and gold. This is Alex Stanzik, and I have with me today my friend and one of the smartest men I know, Mr. Jim Rickards. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for that introduction. So, Jim, with everything going on lately, gold briefly punched through the $1,300 USD per troy ounce ceiling uh, at the London Open. Ray Dalio, who is one of the world's most respected hedge fund managers, the the guy manages money for governments as well as some of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds recently recommended a 5 to 10% allocation to gold. you have any thoughts on uh, gold very briefly before we dive into the rest of our topics? Uh, gee, 5 to 10, 5 to 10% allocation. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not, like, I have a lot of respect for Ray. He's the, the most successful hedge fund alternative fund manager in history, certainly in the Hall of Fame, along with George Soros and Bruce Kovner and Stan Drunken Miller, and you know a, a relatively small handful of others. And I've had occasion to meet him in um, in Greenwich, where we kind of live nearby. I'm over in Darien, so uh, yeah, a lot of respect for his view. But uh, he's come around to exactly what we've been suggesting to listeners all along: five to ten percent. I'd personally recommend ten percent, but that's kind of season to taste, you know, depending on your risk appetite. People say, oh, you know, gold's risky or gold doesn't have a yield and all this, and I'm nervous having it in my portfolio. I just look at people and say, I would be nervous not having it in my portfolio. I can't imagine, you know, going to bed at night or waking up in the morning and not having an allocation to gold. And, um, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, people kind of disparage it in a lot of different ways. And, uh, in fact, you know, they always want to put words in your mouth. They'll say, you know, I mean, I'm out there a lot. I give presentations i do podcasts like this one i have my book the new case for gold and people go oh, jim rickard says you know so the world's coming to an end sell everything buy gold i have never said that i don't believe that uh, the world's not coming to an end we may go through some tumultuous changes uh there may be some you know severe stress in the international monetary system but we've seen that before uh, many times over the past hundred years so that's nothing new uh when that happens uh, you're going to want gold i don't i wouldn't go 100 percent in anything uh, including gold, cash, or any other uh, asset, but ten uh, percent. Uh, they, you know, if you do ten percent in gold, that leaves ninety percent for everything else. Uh, and you know, I'm often asked, well, "What about the everything else?" And you know, there's room for cash. Uh, it's a good asset in tumultuous times. Uh, you know, land, real estate, uh, museum quality collectibles. Um, I invest in private equity. Um, I have some. Tech, I've invested in some technology startups and some. Um, uh, natural resource uh, startups, uh, particularly in the water space. So uh, there's, you know, diversification is uh, is obviously important. But if you don't have 10 percent in gold, and you know, I'll, I'll echo Ray Dalio and say five to 10 percent, uh, man, you are uh, you're you're going you're driving without insurance because uh, if things get bad, that's the first thing you're going to want to get, and you're going to find that you can't get it. Indeed. All right, so let's dive into some of our subjects. Uh, last podcast we discussed. Disinflation, slowing of the U.S. economy, Fed tightening and a weakness, Fed's new pet theory, and uh, North Korea. So on, that's actually our first topic. We first started covering North Korea back in our April podcast. And since then, it's gone from being on nobody's radar to what one white paper described as the world's biggest tinderbox. So I'm going to do a quick recap for those not familiar with the backstory. Uh, we first started talking about North Korea's weapons capability in our April podcast. If you want to hear it, it's available on our podcast page. Jim, you went on a major news station and said that the North Korea threat was escalating and that the U.S. would be at war with North Korea in short order, which was met with huge skepticism. An hour later, um, North Korea launched an ICBM test missile. So continuing, next North Korea conducted a series of ICBM tests. U.S. intelligence has confirmed they can fit a uh, miniaturized nuclear warhead into a missile-sized payload. Intel estimates are that, are that they're sitting on up to 60 warheads at this time. On Tuesday, August 8th, Trump made the comment that North Korea had best not make any more threats to the United States and that they would be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. On August 9th, North Korea 
revealed its plans to strike Guam with four nuclear missiles and that the green light to do so would come from Kim Jong-un. So current estimates are that a, that it would be a 14-minute flight time for a North Korean missile to reach Guam. Now, for those who are not familiar, familiar with Guam, it's a U.S. island territory in Micronesia. It's a forward staging area for projection of U.S. sea and air power. It's home base to a number of U.S. nuclear attack submarines. These aren't the ones that vertically fire nuclear missiles, but they hunt other submarines. It's their primary role. But they can also launch, launch sorry, Tomahawk land attack missiles. They can provide uh, insertion options for U.S. SEAL teams. Um, also located on Guam is Anderson Air Force Base. It's the home to the U.S. 36th Wing. It includes intelligence aircraft, fighter interceptors, and uh, the air base, importantly, acts as one of only two critical forward air bases for U.S. long-range bombers in the Pacific. So it's a pretty important installation. On August 10th, the U.S. Air Force, in an unprecedented move, transferred all three main bomber types in the U.S. arsenal to Guam. And that includes B-1 Lancers, B-2 Stealth Bombers, and B-52 Stratofortresses. So as of now, North Korea has backed down on the threat regarding Guam, but the fact remains that they are continuing to develop capabilities in defiance of the world, asking them to halt their nuclear weapons program. So Jim, let's game theory a bit. Where does it go from here? Well, first of all, uh, Alex, that was a fantastic summary. I've actually been, uh, as you know, to the Pentagon a number of times for briefings on different topics. I, I feel like I just sat through a Pentagon briefing because that was very thorough. I don't uh, have a lot to add to that uh, in terms of logistics other than to say I've, I've actually been to Guam and Saipan uh, in the northern and southern Marianas uh, in, in the area you described. And, uh, yeah, it's U.S. territory. I mean, I was very disturbed when uh, after the ICBM test, uh, newspapers were publishing – uh, well, before that, there was another, uh, I think, the Hwasong-12 missile. Uh, there were other tests that were more in the intermediate range. Then you're right, they made a big breakthrough with this uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, which is a much further range. But um, these things, uh, the newspapers are publishing maps showing concentric circles from Pyongyang as to the range of the missiles to give readers an idea of how far they can go. And I saw one that uh, they said, well, we're not worried because it can't reach Los Angeles. And I looked at the map, and it covered Guam and, and Alaska. I said, "Well, the last time I looked, you know, Alaska was a state, and Guam was U.S. territory." I mean, I don't, I don't understand this uh, view that uh, if it's not a densely populated city, which of course we should care about, that somehow uh, it's not a threat to the United States because it, it, it certainly is. And you're right, Guam is U.S. territory. A lot of Americans uh, living there. Um, so the point is, this escalation has continued now. The sequence, let's just do the recent sequence, because I think you, you did a good job of covering the, you know, this is, by the way, this has been going on for 25 years. We may have been warning listeners about it ahead of uh, the pack, so to speak, uh, months ago. But this has been, this, this threat has been escalating since the mid-90s uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un's father. Uh, and, you know, Bill Clinton did a deal with him, which uh, we released some sanctions in exchange for promises to discontinue the program. They immediately broke that deal. Um, then uh, George Bush did a deal with them, whereby also gave some sanctions relief, uh, and uh, and uh, they immediately broke that deal. So their track record is that they don't they lie and they buy time and they get concessions and they keep building the missiles. and And I do think the Trump and, and the Obama administration essentially did nothing for eight years. So this thing's been kicking around since the mid '90s, um, and I do think the Trump administration deserves credit. For clarity, uh, saying, okay, that, that's it. We're uh, the, the best line I saw, we're not going to negotiate our way to the negotiations. If you want to come to the table and talk to us, we'll meet with you. And we'll tell you right now that what you have to do is verifiably discontinue your weapons programs. And, and what you get in exchange for that, let's talk. And obviously there would be sanctions relief and maybe even integrate the North Korean economy into the global economy. They're, they're actually very rich in natural resources. It's an interesting country. They could be a commodity-driven exporter and, you know, have a, have a decent economy. But, of course, they're completely cut off. So now the recent uh, – that's the backstory. The recent sequence of events – let's go back to uh, August 8th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, the stock market went down about 1.2 percent. That's when this rhetoric was dialing up, exactly as you described, Alex. So, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, Kim Jong-un 
talking about attacking Guam. Uh, Trump saying this will be met with fire and fury. Uh, Guam or uh, Kim Jong Un saying, "I'm waiting for the battle plans. We're, we're launching at Guam, etc." Now that weekend, uh, I have to look at a calendar. I think the weekend of the uh, of August 12th and and uh, 13th. What happened was a lot of national security officials went on television. Uh, General, uh, you know, H.R. McMaster, who's the national security advisor, um, Rex Tillerson, uh, others uh, gave interviews, and they dialed it back. They said, "Look, you know, war is not imminent." Yeah. You know, by the way, you can't. You, you have to agree with that. War is not imminent. If you know, if it's coming in, if there's a high probability it's coming in early 2018, is that imminent? Well, not in the sense that someone's going to, you know, launch an attack tomorrow. But that's close enough for investors to start thinking about it if they uh, uh, if they cared, and I certainly think they should. So yeah, I'll I'll buy the fact that it's not imminent. They dialed down the rhetoric, and then Monday, uh, Kim Jong Un seemed to respond in kind. He said, "Well, I've got the battle plan, but I'm not ready to launch it." So that seemed, you know, by at least by his standards, a little bit conciliatory. And then Trump made a statement saying. Um, well, you know, we, we welcome this, uh, not thaw, but, you know, we welcome this progress and maybe we can, there's some basis for talking. So all of a sudden, you know, stocks take off. It looks like the threat's over. Everyone's dying like that. That is not how I read it at all. If you actually look at what Kim Jong-un said, he said, I will not launch at Guam if the United States engages in acceptable behavior or maybe stay in the negative if they don't engage in unacceptable behavior. Um, that was a very sp specific reference to a joint U.S.-South Korean military exercise that is conducted periodically. It's a big one uh, that they're going to launch on Monday, August 21st. And you know these military exercises. They have very long uh, uh, you know, engagement periods. They, and this one lasts for uh, about a week, I think, August 21st to 28th. has a lot of moving parts, you know, all, all branches of the military. So what Kim Jong-un was saying is, I won't launch a Guam if you call off that exercise. That's what he meant by the U.S. not doing anything, you know, engaging in bad behavior. You don't have to read between the lines very much to see that's what he meant. Well, we're not going to call off the exercise. The U.S. is not going to be bullied. We're not going to be threatened. This exercise is long planned, and, uh, and we're going to go ahead and do it. So the minute we do, we have now broken uh, the condition on which uh, – Kim Jong-un was refraining. So my expectation is he will test one of these systems. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. You talked about the miniaturization, Alex. Um, there are actually a lot of technologies you have to master to be able to do this. Um, you know, you have to get your hands on, uh, you have to get your hands on uranium uh, or plutonium. You have to enrich it. That's very demanding technologically. You have to build missiles. That's demanding technologically. They have a certain range. Then you have to uh, miniaturize uh, the the warhead so you can fit it on the missile. A, a nuclear device that would just detonate and, and create a chain reaction and be a nuclear explosion could be the size of a truck. Uh, that's called a device. It's not necessarily weaponized because it's hard to deliver. But you get it sm small enough. And then finally, you've got the, what's called ruggedize it, which means that it, I mean, these missiles go into space, and they, the ICBMs do. I mean, they come back into the atmosphere. That you know, that's, It's a lot of stress and heat and, and vibration, and it's got to survive all that. Well, one by one, he's mastered all these technologies, and it looks like he's getting to the final two, miniaturization, which you mentioned, and, uh, and ruggedization. That comes from testing. Um, but there's one more thing he's doing, and this is where I think it gets very, very dangerous. He's got a submarine, and he might launch, uh, there's some reason uh, to believe that he will launch, a submarine-launched uh, uh, ballistic missile. And that's different from an ICBM because you can move submarines around. So the U.S. has been betting on this THAAD defense, terminal high altitude defense, where we can, to some degree of accuracy, shoot down these missiles. No one wants to rely on that because it's not 100 percent, but, you know, it's better than nothing. But you can move a submarine to create a trajectory where you're abating the THAAD missile batteries, number one. Secondly, you can move that submarine to uh, within range where it would support an intermediate range ballistic, ballistic missile attack. Doesn't have to be an ICBM. So it's, it's it's a total game changer, and there's some reason to think that's what he's going to do. He also might detonate a nuclear uh, device, a nuclear explosion, to perfect that technology. That's not a missile launch. That's a nuclear detonation. But any one of these things is highly provocative. So my expectation is that the U.S. will go ahead as planned with this war game that Kim Jong-un had planned all along to do the test, knowing the U.S. would do this, put this marker down to make him look like a good guy. But, of course, he's not a good guy. And that he'll do something extreme if he doesn't 
aim a missile at, in the vicinity of Guam, which would practically be an act of war. Uh, there could be the submarine launch uh, test or a nuclear explosion, and that'll get Trump going again, and we'll be right back where we were on August 8th. So uh, this threat is not going away. Uh, we had kind of a, people dial the back a little bit last weekend. I think it's coming back at us, and uh, the stock market is extremely vulnerable. You don't have to reach hard to find people who think it's overvalued. I mean, we don't need to belabor that. Uh, I'm not the stock market guy, but go to any, you know, from Robert Schiller to Warren Buffett, to any uh, well-respected voice on that topic, and you, you hear universally that the stock market's overvalued, headed for a fall, and then the question is when, and the answer is, uh, you know, it could be any time it takes a catalyst. Well, this could be the catalyst. So, you know, on top of the terror attacks we've seen, you know, in uh, um, in Spain on uh, Thursday and Finland on Friday, and there just seems to be no end to it. That was enough to get the stock market heading in the wrong direction uh, the course of the Thursday and Friday. Um, let's see what happens. But uh, I think uh, stocks are vulnerable to this kind of shock. The market that has not priced it in, and I do think it's coming probably next week. Sure. So, and, you know, this reminds me of many conversations you and I have had in regards to uh, complex systems, complex systems in critical states, and that really is just a shift of psychology. Uh, and it's it's just human nature. You know, people, after a while, people become kind of um, apathetic towards things, and it takes sometimes, unfortunately, um, events which would shake people up and, and wake people up, and, and that's kind of what we're looking at. So... Moving on to our next topic, um, we, by the way, we will continue to monitor what's going on with the with the North Korea situation, and, and uh, if there are important updates, of course, um, Jim and I will probably discuss it again in a, in a future podcast. But our um, our next topic here is uh, the debt ceiling and the so called government shutdown. So this topic has been discussed over and over again. Personally, I'm kind of disgusted with the fact that we have to do this versus proper fiscal management at the government level, and I know I'm not alone in this, the United States is now sitting on $19.974 trillion in debt. That is $165,851 U.S. dollars per taxpayer. Uh, but it's still a reality we have to deal with on a regular basis now. So Secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has written a letter to Congress asking them to raise the debt limit um, no later than September 29th. Jim, what's your take on all this? Uh, good luck with that. Uh, so you're, you're absolutely right, Alex, in terms of the backdrop. But let's, um, let's just sort out for the listeners. There are two really big but separate uh, deadlines converging on September 29th. And you know, the, the way the media reports it, they throw words around, they tend to get mashed together, I think, in a lot of readers' minds or listeners' minds, but they're, they're separate and they're, they're converging. It's like two, two meteors hitting the earth at once. One is um, the one you mentioned, which is the debt ceiling. And this has to do with, uh, you know, the borrowing authority of the U.S. Treasury. Is the U.S. Tre Treasury authorized to borrow money to pay the bills of the United States, the bills being, you know, everything from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, operations of government, military, you name it, the whole, the whole, uh, Budget, which is in the you know around the five five hundred billion uh, uh, dollars a year. Well, actually, the, the, that's the de that's the deficit. The uh, the budget's over well over um, several trillion, but um, but that has to be authorized by Congress. Now, until it's authorized, the Treasury is just running on fumes. It, it sounds strange, but the Treasury has a bank account at the Fed. They also have bank accounts at other banks, and it's no different than your bank account or my bank account. If we have money in the bank and we spend it. And there's no income, you know, they, that account goes to zero, and all of a sudden your checks bounce, and you can't uh, spend any more money. And that's the situation, believe it or not, that the U.S. Treasury is facing. The Treasury is running out of cash. They have cash coming in all the time from tax collections. There's, there's always new cash coming in, but it's going out too in terms of payments. Uh, and uh, if you run negative cash flow and draw it down, so that's the situation the Treasury is facing. They need Congress to authorize an increase in the debt ceiling. So they can borrow more money, so they can pay their bills. It's that simple. The problem is the Congress is not really functional right now. It's not inclined to do so. And the reason is the Republicans do have a majority of the House and the Senate. I mean, that's, that's well known. But they, the Republicans can't agree among themselves. There are members of what's called the House Freedom Caucus. By the way, this is kind of a replay of Obamacare. Uh, I don't want to get into the weeds in, in terms of the health care debate, but uh, I think a lot of listeners know that the Republicans came into Washington 
with control of both houses of Congress and the White House, and they go, man, we're going to repeal Obamacare. And they didn't do it, and they're not going to do it because they couldn't agree among themselves. They didn't need Democratic votes, but they did need to agree, and they couldn't do that. Same thing is playing out. This House Freedom Caucus says, well, we're not voting for the debt ceiling increase unless we get some conditions. And what about they, they want to defund Planned Parenthood. They want, uh, there's an issue around sanctuary cities. There's an issue around money for the wall. The White House wants, you know, money for the wall. Um, and and the, there's a, an Obamacare fix. It's not the repeal of Obamacare, but Obamacare was running out of money. And, and that uh, is a separate appropriation that's got to get through. So there's a bunch of stuff standing in the way of this vote. Now you can say, well, okay, the heck with Republicans. Let's just get moderate Republican votes and some Democrats. Well, the Democrats are sitting there, and this Nancy Pelosi, right? She said, why should we help you guys? <laughs> you've, you've run us out of town. You've ridiculed us. You've, you've called us every name in the book. You don't want to work with us on anything else. You don't like our agenda. Why should we give you any votes? Uh, even though the Democrats in general favor uh, raising the debt ceiling because um, they like spending money and they like all these programs, uh, they're not inclined to vote for two for it for two reasons. Number one, why should they help Republicans? Number two, they don't want all these riders attached to the ones I mentioned. I mean, if you put if you put defunding and Planned Parenthood in a debt ceiling vote, you will not get one Democratic vote. So it's not clear where the votes are coming from. And um, now let me just shift gears for a second and talk about another event, which is the budget. Now the budget is different than the, the, the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is borrowing to pay your bills, but the budget is, you know, that, that authorizes all the government spending, you know, that gives rise to having to pay your bills in the first place. The U.S. is on a fiscal year. The United States fiscal year runs from uh, October 1st to midnight on September 30th. And that, that's it. It's like we all, most of us are, you know, December 31st, New Year's Eve. The U.S. government uh, celebrates New Year's Eve on September 30th. This year, uh, September 30th happens to be a Saturday, you know, when, when the banks are closed and the government's not working. So it's really September 29th, which is the Friday. So September 29th is D-Day in terms of keeping the government open. Uh, and you can only do that with a, now there are two ways to do it. One, you could pass a real budget, which is kind of what you were saying, Alex. Are we mature enough to actually do that? And the answer is no. But the other thing you can do is what's called a CR, which is a continuing resolution. And it basically is a vote by Congress says, okay, we agree that all the agencies can keep spending whatever they were spending before. We'll get back to you about new spending, new programs, terminations, all that stuff. We'll fight about that later. But for now, keep spending. That's what a continuing resolution is. Now, here's the thing. That's a hard, hard stop on September 29th, for the reason I mentioned. The debt ceiling doesn't have to happen at the end of September. It can happen at any time in years past. Uh, I've seen this happen in March. Uh, I've seen it happen in uh, you know, other, other times of year. It just so happens by coincidence that it looks like the Treasury is going to run out of cash on September 29th. So you've got, as I say, two, two meteors, two asteroids striking the Earth. One is the the budget authorization in the form of a continuing resolution. The other one is a debt ceiling increase um, in, in the form of authorizing the Treasury to borrow money. They don't have to happen at the same time, but they are happening at the same time. And they're subject to the same dysfunctions. In other words, the issues I mentioned, the wall, Planned Parenthood, Obamacare fix, sanctuary cities, uh, those issues that pop up in the debt ceiling debate also pop up in the continuing resolution budget debate. There is no consensus on any of them. It's not where it's not clear where the votes are coming from. Now, just to kind of you know add another layer of intrigue here, or dysfunction is probably a better word. It's not clear that the White House is so afraid of a government shutdown. I mean, that's what happens, by the way. You get a, you get a government shutdown. Non-essential workers stay home. Uh, you know, the army is still on duty. The military is still on duty. The uh, TSA still works at airports. The the post office is still open, but there are a lot of government functions that do shut down, including popular ones like, you know, national parks and monuments. They're the ones that tend to be most visible. Um, the White House might like that. The White House, remember, the White House, they're not exactly Republicans. I mean, they kind of are and they aren't. I mean, you know, Jared Kushner and Ivanka, they, they seem like Gary Cohen. All these guys seem more like Democrats. Trump is very hard to categorize. I wouldn't call him a conservative Republican at all. He's a, he's a nationalist. Uh, he's a Trumpist. But he's a capitalist. He's he's a lot of things, but I wouldn't call him I wouldn't call him a conservative Republican. So he's he's just as eager to fight with the House Freedom Caucus and Mitch McConnell as he is with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And he might say, you know, what we need is what we need, folks, is a good government shutdown. Let's show the American people 
just how dysfunctional we are, just how immature we are, uh, et cetera. Again, I don't want to take sides in that debate. My role is just to warn listeners that um, these two things are coming together. I don't see how they get resolved. And by the way, on top of everything we just mentioned, Alex, it takes time to do these things. There, there's something called the legislative calendar. Don't think for a minute that Congress works, you know, seven days a week or even five days a week. They have a tendency to, you know, they, they go back to the districts on the weekends. They have a tendency to show up Monday night and leave Thursday afternoon. So they probably work about three days a week, not to mention holidays. You know, and their, their idea of a Labor Day weekend is a 10-day recess. So we, most of us are happy to get an extra day off. They'll take 10 days, you know, for Labor Day. So the point is the legislative calendar only shows 11 working days between now and uh, what we're talking about, the September 29th uh, train wreck. Uh, it, it takes the members of Congress like 11 days to, you know, find their way to the, 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 the bathroom, you know. So the, the point is they've got a lot of other stuff on their plate. They've got judicial appointments. They've got to confirm the FBI director. Uh, there's some, like, cats and dogs legislation around Obamacare. We have a, we have a national security crisis with Korea, uh, not to mention all the, the sound and fury about, uh, you know, racism in Charlottesville. Again, don't want to get in the weeds on that, but that's obviously adding to the dysfunction. So put this all together, the fact that the White House might not mind a train wreck, the fact that there's probably a train wreck coming anyway, the shortness of time and the degree of difficulty and the lack of consensus, I think you could have um, a government shutdown. I think you will have a government shutdown on October 1st, uh, really effectively midnight, September 29th. And I think this debt ceiling crisis is going to go right up to the deadline. Now, that doesn't have a date certain. Uh, September 29th is an estimate for that. But imagine you're running a bond portfolio and you're sitting there saying, huh, you know, like a big one, like a pension fund or something. Uh, and you're like, huh, is, is the United States going to pay me the interest due? Uh, and by the way, there's big, big outflows on October 1st because it's the first day of the month. You got Social Security and all these welfare programs and benefit programs. And that's one of those days when the outflows are greatly in excess of the inflows. Uh, people tend to pay their taxes in April and by October you're running on empty. So this is a mess on top of all the other, you know, serious national security, terrorism and other messes we described. One more reason, in my view, why... Uh, investors should have uh, should be over allocated to gold right now and, and also have some cash. So when you're uh, <clears throat> discussing the, the schedule of, of how uh, these politicians work, I'm just I'm just over here shaking my head thinking, uh, ah, the good life. Hopefully someday we'll we'll be able to, to rein that situation in. Yeah. Um, OK, so moving on to our, to our next topic. As you and I have talked about many times, the world economy is heavily interlinked and many of our listeners are professional money managers. So uh, oftentimes we will discuss what's going on in other jurisdictions. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about China. There's this disturbing trend going on over there where the banks are slowly becoming the majority in uh, or I should say the larger share of the investor base in these things called wealth management products or WMPs. So, you know, just from, from our discussions and what I've looked at in the past, the entire scheme of the, the WMTP structure, it seems really questionable to me. Jim, what are the risks here and uh, the potential spillover effects for the global markets? Well, the risks are huge and the spillover effects are huge. And we've had a, a taste of this um, a couple of times recently. Uh, uh, you know, you go back to August uh, 10th, 2015, so just about two years ago. Uh, China did a shock devaluation of the Chinese yuan, that's their currency. It's one that markets didn't see coming, that even the elites, uh, the IMF and the U.S. Treasury and others did not see coming. Uh, China had their own reasons for doing it. That caused a shock in U.S. stock markets from August 10th to um, uh, September 1st. Just go back and look at a chart. U.S. stocks fell about 11 percent, and it was worse than that. It wasn't just that they went down 11 percent. It looked like there was no end in sight. I mean, it happened to be from, from peak to trough, it was an 11 percent drawdown. But when you're down 10 percent, you didn't know that it was going to turn around at 11. It could have gone down 20 uh, as far as you were concerned. Think about where you were on August 31st, 1st, 2015, you know, maybe uh, taking the kids back to school or on vacation or, you know, getting ready for Labor Day weekend. But it felt investors had a sick uh, – 
feeling in the pit of their stomach. It felt like there was no bottom. And then, you know, the Fed rode to the rescue. And that was when we were going to have the liftoff in interest rates in September. They pushed the liftoff back to December, got involved in forward guidance, happy talk, and, and the, the problem went away. But it, it was pretty bad then. The second time was uh, December 2015. Uh, sorry, December 2000. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, December 2015, when China did a kind of stealth evaluation, they learned their lesson on the shock evaluation, so they were doing it in baby steps. But again, the U.S. market reacted badly from January 1st, 2016 to February 10th, 2016. The stock market also fell 11%. So U.S. stock market. So there you have two examples of what's called, uh, you can say contagion, that's a good word. Uh, the IMF uses the word spillovers, you know, like one bucket spills over to another bucket. I, you know, pick your metaphor, but the point is um, the, to say that the U.S. markets are isolated or immune or pristine relative to Chinese devaluations or Chinese financial market events is false. Uh, we have two examples of stocks almost spinning out of control based on Chinese actions. So let's come back to the WMPs. I'll take a minute just, um, pardon me, I'll take a minute just to explain what a WMP is. As you said, it stands for Wealth Management Product. It's a pretty simple concept. So you're a middle class Chinese saver. You know, you're not a princeling or an oligarch, but you and your spouse have a good job and you got some savings and you walk into the bank and uh, the bank uh, officer says, OK, we have two products in effect. You can make a bank deposit and we'll pay you 2 percent interest or you can buy a WMP and we'll pay you 7 percent. And most people think about that for two seconds and they go, well, I'll take the 7 percent. Thank you very much. And, and they do. Uh, but what, what doesn't what kind of gets lost in translation, even in uh, in Chinese, is these wealth management products are not get bank products. They're not liabilities of the banks. They're off balance sheet special products. They're very much like CDOs. Because what they do is the banks take the money that people put into the WMPs, they bundle it, they go out and buy junk bonds or equity in real estate, um, state-owned enterprises, uh, bankrupt companies, uh, you know, speculative land deals, uh, ghost cities, you name it, uh, but they're out there buying all this garbage. And so they look like these, you know, Lehman Brothers CDOs from, um, you know, from the 2007, 2006, 7, and 8 period, which of course almost brought down the world. Now, so they don't really tell that to the customer. I'm sure there's some disclosure somewhere in the fine print, no one reads it. And I've seen interviews with, um, everyday savers and you know people walking out of a bank and a reporter goes up and says well what did you do with your money you know, i bought a wmp and they'll say to the person well don't you know that you know that's not uh, the equivalent of fdic insured that's not a bank liability it's not guaranteed by anybody it's high and they go <clears throat> and well, of course some people don't know that but some people say yeah i know that but beijing will bail us out and yeah. you hear I, I've been to, I've been that is the attitude over there absolutely yeah i've been i've been to china a number of times i've actually been out in the the boondocks of China. I've met with provincial uh, Communist Party officials, and I said, "I'm very frank with these guys." I, I was having tea in one office near one of these ghost cities, and I said to these guys, "I said, you know, can you build seven cities here? I'm looking at them. They're all vacant. They're, every building I'm looking at is vacant." I said, "How you?" And he did it all with debt. I said, "How are you going to pay back the debt?" And he goes, "We can't pay back the debt. That's impossible. Beijing is going to bail us out." So you hear this over and over from you know government officials to the man or woman in the street. So, but be that as it may, uh, these WMPs are a Ponzi, and I don't just throw the word out there lightly. It, it's the case that, let's say I buy a two-year WMP, so, and I bought it two years ago, and I go back to the bank, and it's maturing, and they say, okay, you know, Mr. Rickers, we can roll over your WMP into a new two-year WMP. Uh, and I might say, fine, you know, I'm, getting my, I'm collecting my 7% interest, but, you know, Bernie Madoff investors collected their uh, interest also. I just they didn't know that their money was gone. Um, and uh, and but what if I say you know I'm, my kid's going to college in the states. I need the money. I cash out my WMP. Well, they've got they've invested in all these junk assets, so they can't really cash out the WMP. But what they do, they sell the, a new WMP to the next person who walks in the door, and they take that money and give it to me. So the new person's happy because she's getting seven percent. I'm happy because I got my money back. But meanwhile, the money's not there. You, you have to sell the new ones to pay off the old ones. And what you really hope is that the old ones roll over so you never really have to, so that your net inflows are positive, so you don't have net outflows. This is a Ponzi. Ponzi, by the way, the chairman of the Bank of China in an interview, and I quoted this in my, uh, my, uh, my book, um, The Death of Money, said, 
it's a positive. It's not it's not my analysis. It, happen, it happens to be my analysis, but we have it on record from Chinese officials. So, so that's where we are. And we all know that all Ponzi's fail eventually and they collapse and they'll cause a panic and that's coming. But it doesn't have to be tomorrow. This, you know, Ponzi can go on for a long time. Madoff ran his Ponzi for 20 years. 20 years. The guy's like spending the money on himself, losing it and other things, but convincing investors that it's all good. And as long as you pay the coupon, you know, people feel good about it. Now, I saw an article, um, a chart and analysis last week, and I think this is what you're referring to, Alex, which is which shows that the amount of WMPs is going down. And this was taken as a positive by the analysts. They said, well, this is great. You know, China's finally stepping up to the plate. They're finally getting things under control. Uh, it's good that the leverage in the system is going down. Isn't this wonderful that WMPs are going down? I said, no, that's that's a nightmare because that's like Bernie Madoff saying my assets under management are going down. Well, if you don't have the money and you get into uh, ne- you get into net cash flows, uh, negative cash flows or net outflows in a Ponzi. See, if it's, if it was a real product, right? If it was you know wisely invested and you saw it going down, you might say to yourself. Okay, that's good. You know, there's there's more liquidity in the system. Uh, they're reducing leverage. You know, they're they're getting. They're not acting as crazy on real estate. It would be a good thing if it wasn't a Ponzi. But people forget that it is a Ponzi. And when you see assets in a Ponzi going down, that means the run on the bank has started, and this this fire is spin out of control. So, to me, that's one of the scariest indicators I've seen. One more reason to to expect. That uh, that China is about to implode. Now, just to be clear, nothing's happening in China until either the end of this year or early 2018. And the reason for that has nothing to do with economics, everything to do with politics. There's a National Communist Party Congress. They haven't set the exact date yet. It'll be late October, early November, but be that as it may, uh, and President Xi is going to be anointed, if you will, as as the the big Xi, the big the big man. Uh, the, the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong, uh, and he doesn't want to rock the boat. So no, no crises are going to break out in Japan, or sorry, in China, uh, between now and November, because he doesn't want to rock the boat ahead of this party Congress. And they can back that up because they still use firing squads if they have to. Um, but the point being, once we get past the party Congress, Xi has achieved his power goals, and we're into 2018. And you know, two plus two does not equal five. I think you're going to see. Some of these chickens come home to roost, and ha- and you, if you said to me, how does that play out? Like, what do they do? I would expect a, de- a devaluation of the currency because devaluation of the currency, um, it basically uh, it solves the capital outflow problem. You can reopen the capital account because people are not as anxious to get their money out. If once once you steal their money, you can't steal it twice. So they say, well, I might as well sit here, uh, and not try to get my money out. But uh, uh, I-, I would expect a maxi devaluation to boost exports, boost export related jobs. Um, you know, cure the capital outflow issue. But right now, for right now, they're squashing everything. So don't look for drama from China before the end of the year, but I would look for a lot of drama next year. You know, what that reminds me of, Jim, is uh, when you had mentioned uh, that they all believe the government's going to bail them out if there's problems. You know, I've been to China a number of times talking to uh, money managers and government officials and whatnot. Um, before... 2015-ish, I had I had kind of made a trip, talked to five of the largest fund managers in China. They all said the same thing. They basically they weren't concerned about the banks, they weren't concerned about the markets. And then in June of 2015, if I'm sure you remember, there was the, the Chinese stock market crash. Right. And what ended up happening, interestingly enough, is is that the government basically froze everything. They told them all you can no longer trade. You're not allowed to sell. They were even going so far as to making criminal investigations to fund managers that were selling positions during that time, and they right. locked down the liquidity. So you've you've mentioned um, something like that in terms of ICE nine in 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 your recent books, and that's right. something that's a big deal right now. I mean, every professional money manager I talk to nowadays, that's the biggest question on their mind is what is the liquidity like, and I might add to that. Not only what is the liquidity like, but keep in mind that secondary markets, stock markets, etc., can get shut down by governments at any time. If things are going badly, it can happen. And if you're frozen out of markets, um, you know, super careful. 
it's funny. Uh, I had a conversation with um, an investor the other, just the other day, Alex, and um, I pointed out that on October 19th, 1987, the major U.S. stock market indices, now refer specifically to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, fell 22% in one day. Not a month or a week, but one day. In today's Dow points, a 22% drop would be 4,000 Dow points. Not 400, which would be a really bad day. You know, the other day it was down, uh, I don't know, 275 and everybody was all spun up. 400 would be, you know, dominate every headline. Uh, imagine 4,000 Dow points. Um, and the person I was talking to said, yeah, but they wouldn't let that happen. They've changed the rules. They've got circuit breakers and they would close the exchange. And I said, you're right. They would close the exchange. Now, you tell me which makes you feel better, a 4,000 point drop or a closed exchange? Because at least with a 4,000 point drop, I can still trade. I mean, you, you can get out at a price. You might not like the price, but the, but things are still transacting. But if you shut the market, that's ice nine. And of course, my thesis was that when you shut one market, the demand for liquidity moves to another market, probably money market funds, and then you got to shut that down. And then it moves to another venue, which would probably be, you know, run on the bank, and then you got to shut the bank down, et cetera, and it spreads. So I wouldn't be so glib or sanguine about the fact that you can close the exchange, which you can, uh, because then you got to say, well, what's your next move? Um, and as far as the Chinese bailout is concerned, just briefly, uh, the fact is Beijing will bail them out. But then you have to say, you know, and this is what drives me crazy about Wall Street analysis, because they'll say, well, yeah, but Beijing will bail them out. I'm like, yeah, but what does that mean? You know, because it's going to cost a trillion dollars to do this bailout we've been talking about. China has th $3 trillion in reserves, approximately. About a trillion of that's illiquid. It's real money. I'm not saying it's fake wealth, but it's in the stock market. It's in hedge funds. It's in private equity. I mean, try getting your money back from Henry Kravitz, right? He's not going to give it to you. So uh, at least not until your, your seven years are up or whatever. So uh, so take a trillion off the board because it's there. It's illiquid. There's another trillion that's that has to be held in liquid form as a precautionary reserve to do this bailout. If you use that money, then you then you don't have the money you need to do the bailout. So that means there's really only one trillion of reserves in China that's not already spoken for, either in the form of illiquid assets or precautionary reserve. And when the current and when the reserves were going down in uh, 2016 at a rate of $50 billion a month, you're broke in a year. So China's in a much more precarious situation than uh, than people realize. And you can't just throw the $3 trillion number around without thinking about how much of that is already spoken for. And the answer is $2 trillion. Uh, And that's why I expect the devaluation would be the answer, because that, that does um, solve the capital account problem. Sure. And if you're the Chinese government, why would you blow your dry powder on, on trying to prop, prop every, every, everybody up and, and bail everybody out? I mean, as they've already proven, you could just shut it down and, and threaten people with criminal investigation if they try to trade. So I think, I think um, that's right. It's, it just goes to show. I mean, we've been obviously you and I've been banging the table on why you need to take a hard look at physical gold for a long time. But uh, I think these are all the reasons that, that you have – some of the smartest money managers in the world like Ray Dalio talking about it. So, um, all right. So moving on our last topic, Jim, in our, in our private discussions, you've mentioned something to me called the myth of August for our listeners, Jim, can you elaborate on what that means? Sure. The, the myth of August, it, it started as kind of a fun thing with me, although it's not fun in the sense of the specific events that I used to illustrate it. But, um, and, and the idea, of course, here we are, you know, two thirds of the way through August, so uh, not not too much time left, but plenty of time for fireworks. But um, but the idea was, of course, you know, August is a very popular vacation month. It's the last month before kids go back to school. Um, it's a great time at the beach, it's set mountains, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, from Europe to North America to around the world, you know, a lot of people take their vacations in August. So everyone's, you know, at least my part of the world are in the Hamptons or the Jersey Shore or uh, Cape Cod or wherever. Um, and, uh, you know, offices empty out, um, you know, the whole industry is publishing almost practically shut down and nothing happens. It's just quiet. And we all come back to work on Labor Day and we're rocking and rolling on Labor Day. And uh, it's and that's the myth. The reality 
is quite different. Well, the, the myth persists, by the way. People still think that. But the reality, you look at the things that have happened in August, they're not just newsworthy. They're among the most momentous events in, in history and in financial history. Most famously, tragically, of course, uh, what Barbara Tuckman uh, great writer and historian called the guns of August, which was the, you know, the, the outbreak of World War I. But even in more recent times, it was August 15th, 1971, when Richard Nixon ended the gold standard. Um, it was um, August 7th, 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait uh, and George Bush, uh, Bush 41, said this will not stand. And we sent troops to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, airlifted them into the land of the two holy places, as the Muslims say, literally the next day which, by the way, gave rise to al-Qaeda. Um, it was uh, August um, 1998 that we had the double embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. August, and Bill Clinton responded with cruise missiles. Uh, August 1998 was also the famous Russian default, which led straight to the meltdown, uh, global financial crisis, and meltdown of long-term capital management. And of course, that landed in my lap because I was their general counsel and negotiated that bailout. Um, and uh, August 1991 was the Solomon Brothers trading scandal when uh, Solomon, the largest uh, bond dealer, U.S. bond dealer in the world, almost went bankrupt, which would have started, uh, you know, another financial crisis. Uh, Warren Buffett came in as a white knight, bailed him out, and the Treasury backed off from the threats against Solomon. So that crisis did not go further, but certainly had the potential to do so. Um, August 1991 was also a Russian coup. Uh, this, you know, some uh, some crazy KGB guys kidnapped Mikhail Gorbachev. Remember that one? And they, they, I think the coup was busted because they, they got drunk on vodka, so their situational awareness was not the best. But they did, they did, they did kidnap the the, the general secretary of the Communist Party uh, in an attempted coup. Um, and and go, I don't have to belabor it. You get, oh, Hurricane Katrina, 2005. So don't need to belabor it. Uh, but uh, I'm very wary in August. It's just a lot of very nasty things have happened. We're in the home stretch here, just about 10 days left. So uh, hopefully it's quiet. But, um, but given everything we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Alex, about North Korea, I'm not so sure it will be quiet. Uh, if the U.S. goes ahead with this military exercise, which I expect, and Kim Jong-un responds with some kind of test, whether it's submarine launch ballistic missile, nuclear device, or an ICBM uh, aimed at Guam, which I also expect, then uh, we're not going to make it out of August with, without a, an earthquake and a financial earthquake. Let's see what happens. But uh, I wouldn't uh, put my feet up quite yet. Yeah. And, you know, I think that these are all just really good reminders that, uh, you know, revisiting the whole liquidity thing, um, so many people are so heavily invested in, in various different what you and I call paper products that require some kind of counterparty to perform. You know, the IMF in, in a recent paper basically said that gold is the only financial asset that you can buy that does not require a counterparty for it to retain its value or for it to have value. Right. And um, I wasn't going to share this, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, mention that I, I had a conversation earlier this week with the head of a trading desk. It's got 15 guys under him. They're running a lot of money. It's one of the largest financial houses in the world. If I mentioned the name, everybody would immediately recognize it. I'm not gonna say who this person was, um, but in a, in a candid moment of discussion, he mentioned to me that, that they're, I mean, these guys are pretty nervous about this kind of stuff. They listen to your, our podcast on a regular basis. They, they, they say they don't miss a one. So thanks guys. We appreciate the support. But, uh, you know, he mentioned that if it were up to him, you know, in regards to all the paper investments, in other words, the ones with the counterparty risk and the ones that rely on exchanges to trade, et cetera, if it were up to him, he'd sell it all right now. Yeah, you know, um, first of all, yeah, th th thank you if you're if you're listening. Yeah, thank you and your team for uh, for joining us. Uh, the one thing I would say, Alex, there's there's a name for a store of value that does not have counterparty risk. It's called money. Um, and uh, people say, oh, I have money in the bank. It's, no, you don't. You have a you have a bank deposit, which is an uh, unsecured liability of a occasionally insolvent financial institution. Uh, even a Federal Reserve note, if you read it, it says Federal Reserve note, where I went to law school anyway, a note was a liability, uh, which it is. And so uh, money, people don't think hard about what money is. They take a lot of things for granted and assume it's money and it's not. It's something else. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. And again, 
to go back to where we started, uh, people say I'm nervous about buying gold. I just say I'd be nervous if I didn't have any. Absolutely. All right. That about wraps up today's podcast, Jim. I just want to thank you for the, uh, the time and the, the discussion has been invigorating. I think we covered some really great stuff and I, and I very much look forward to our next one. Thank you. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and Physical Gold Fund presents The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik. Insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance, and gold. This is Alex Stanzik, and I have with me today my friend and one of the smartest men I know, Mr. Jim Rickards. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for that introduction. So, Jim, with everything going on lately, gold briefly punched through the $1,300 USD per troy ounce ceiling uh, at the London Open. Ray Dalio, who is one of the world's most respected hedge fund managers, the, the guy manages money for governments as well as some of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, recently recommended a 5 to 10% allocation to gold. Do you have any thoughts on uh, gold very briefly before we dive into the rest of our topics? Uh, gee, five to ten, five to ten percent allocation. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not, like I have a lot of respect for Ray. He's the, the, the most successful hedge fund alternative fund manager in history, certainly in the Hall of Fame, along with George Soros and Bruce Kovner and Stan Drucker Miller, and you know a, a relatively small handful of others. And I've had occasion to meet him in um, in Greenwich, where we kind of live nearby, him over in Darien. So, uh, yeah, a lot of respect for his view. But uh, he's come around to exactly what we've been suggesting to listeners all along, 5 to 10%. I personally recommend 10%, but that's kind of season to taste, you know, depending on your risk appetite. People say, oh, you know, gold's risky or gold doesn't have a yield and all this, and I'm nervous having it in my portfolio. I just look at people and say, I would be nervous not having it in my portfolio. I can't imagine, you know, going to bed at night or waking up in the morning and not having an allocation to gold. And, um, you know, people – uh, uh yeah, you know, people kind of disparage it in a lot of different ways. And uh, in fact, you know, they always want to put words in your mouth. They'll say, you know, I mean, I'm out there a lot. I give presentations. I do podcasts like this one. I have my book, The New Case for Gold. And people go, oh, Jim Rickard says, you know, so the world's coming to an end. Sell everything, buy gold. I have never said that. I don't believe that. Uh, the world's not coming to an end. We may go through some tumultuous changes. Uh, there may be some you know, severe stress in the international monetary system, but we've seen that before uh, many times over the past hundred years. So that's nothing new. Uh, when that happens, uh, you're going to want gold. I don't. I wouldn't go 100 percent in anything, uh, including gold, cash, or any other uh, asset. But 10 uh, percent. Uh, they, you know, if you do 10 percent in gold, that leaves 90 percent for everything else. Uh, and you know, I'm often asked, well, what about the everything else? And you know, there's room for cash. Uh, it's a good asset in tumultuous times. Uh, you know, land, real estate, uh, museum quality collectibles. Um, I invest in private equity. Um, I have some. Tech, I've invested in some technology startups and some um, uh, natural resource uh, startups, uh, particularly in the water space. So uh, there's, you know, diversification is uh, is obviously important. But if you don't have 10 percent in gold, and you know, I'll, I'll echo Ray Dalio and say five to 10 percent. Uh, man, you are uh, you're you're going you're driving without insurance because uh, if things get bad, that's the first thing you're going to want to get, and you're going to find that you can't get it. Indeed. All right, so let's dive into some of our subjects. Uh, last podcast, we discussed disinflation, slowing of the U.S. economy, Fed tightening, and a weakness, Fed's new pet theory, and uh, North Korea. So on that's actually our first topic. We first started covering. North Korea back in our April podcast, and since then it's gone from being on nobody's radar to what one white paper described as the world's biggest tinderbox. So I'm going to do a quick recap for those not familiar with the backstory. Uh, we first started talking about North Korea's weapons capability in our April podcast. If you want to hear it, it's available on our podcast page. Jim, you went on a major news station and said that the North Korea threat was escalating and that the U.S. would be at war with North Korea in short order, which was met with huge skepticism. An hour later, 
um, North Korea launched an ICBM test missile. So continuing, next North Korea conducted a series of ICBM tests. U.S. intelligence has confirmed they can fit a miniaturized nuclear warhead into a missile-sized payload. Intel estimates are that or that they're sitting on up to 60 warheads at this time. On Tuesday, August 8th, Trump made the comment that North Korea had best not make any more threats to the United States and that they would be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. On August 9th, North Korea revealed its plans to strike Guam with four nuclear missiles and that the green light to do so would come from Kim Jong-un. So current estimates are that a that it would be a 14 minute flight time for a North Korean missile to reach Guam. Now, for those who are not familiar familiar with Guam, it's a US island territory in Micronesia. It's a forward staging area for projection of US sea and air power. It's home base to a number of US nuclear attack submarines. These aren't the ones that vertically fire nuclear missiles, but they hunt other submarines It's their primary role. But they can also launch, launch sorry, Tomahawk land attack missiles they can provide uh, insertion options for U.S. SEAL teams. Um, also located on Guam is Anderson Air Force Base. It's the home to the U.S. 36th Wing. It includes intelligence aircraft, fighter interceptors, and uh, the air base, importantly, acts as one of only two critical forward air bases for U.S. long-range bombers in the Pacific. So it's a pretty important installation. On August 10th, the U.S. Air Force, in an unprecedented move, transferred all three main bomber types in the U.S. arsenal to Guam, and that includes B-1 Lancers, B-2 Stealth Bombers, and B-52 Stratofortresses. So, as of now, North Korea is backed down on the threat regarding Guam, but the fact remains that they are continuing to develop capabilities in defiance of the world, asking them to halt their nuclear weapons program. So, Jim, let's game theory a bit. Where does it go from here? Well, first of all, uh, Alex, that was a fantastic summary. I've actually been, uh, as you know, to the Pentagon a number of times for briefings on different topics. I, I feel like I just sat through a Pentagon briefing because that was very thorough. I don't uh, have a lot to add to that uh, in terms of logistics other than to say I've, I've actually been to Guam and Saipan uh, in the northern and southern Marianas uh, in, in the area you described. And, uh, yeah, it's U.S. territory. I mean, I was very disturbed when uh, after the ICBM test, uh, newspapers were publishing – uh, well, before that, there was another, uh, I think, the Hwasong-12 missile. Uh, there were other tests that were more in the intermediate range. Then you're right, they made a big breakthrough with this uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, which is a much further range. But um, these things, uh, the newspapers are publishing maps showing concentric circles from Pyongyang as to the range of the missiles to give readers an idea of how far they can go. And I saw one that uh, they said, well, we're not worried because it can't reach Los Angeles. And I looked at the map, and it covered Guam and, and Alaska. I said, "Well, the last time I looked, you know, Alaska was a state, and Guam was U.S. territory." I mean, I don't, I don't understand this uh, view that uh, if it's not a densely populated city, which of course we should care about, that somehow uh, it's not a threat to the United States because it, it, it certainly is. And you're right, Guam is U.S. territory. A lot of Americans uh, living there. Um, so the point is, this escalation has continued now. The sequence, let's just do the recent sequence because I think you, you did a good job of covering the, you know, this is, by the way, this has been going on for 25 years. We may have been warning listeners about it ahead of uh, the pack, so to speak, uh, months ago, but this has been, this, this threat has been escalating since the mid 90s uh, with uh, Kim Jong un's father. Uh, and, you know, Bill Clinton did a deal with him, which uh, we released some sanctions in exchange for promises to discontinue the program. They immediately broke that deal. Um, then uh, George Bush did a deal with them, whereby also gave some sanctions relief, uh, and uh, and uh, they immediately broke that deal. So their track record is that they don't they lie and they buy time and they get concessions and they keep building the missiles. and And I do think the Trump and, and the Obama administration essentially did nothing. There are two really big but separate uh, deadlines converging on September 29th. And you know the, the way the media reports it, they throw words around, they tend to get mashed together, I think, in a lot of readers' minds or listeners' minds, but they're, they're separate and they're, they're converging. It's like two, two meteors hitting the earth at once. One is um, the one you mentioned, which is the debt ceiling. 
And this has to do with, uh, you know, the borrowing authority of the U.S. Treasury. Is the U.S. Tre Treasury authorized to borrow money to pay the bills of the United States, the bills being, you know, everything from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, operations of government, military, you name it, the whole, the whole uh, budget, which is in the, you know, around the five, 500 billion uh, uh, dollars a year. Well, actually, the, the, that's the de that's the deficit. The uh, the budget's over well over um, several trillion, but um, but that has to be authorized by Congress. Now, until it's authorized, the Treasury is just running on fumes. It, it sounds strange, but the Treasury has a bank account at the Fed. They also have bank accounts at other banks, and it's no different than your bank account or my bank account. If we have money in the bank and we spend it and there's no income, you know, they, that account goes to zero, and all of a sudden your checks bounce and you can't. Uh, spend any more money. And that's the situation, believe it or not, that the U.S. Treasury is facing. The Treasury is running out of cash. They have cash coming in all the time from tax collections. There's, there's always new cash coming in, but it's going out, too, in terms of payments. Uh, and uh, if you run negative cash flow and draw it down. So that's the situation the Treasury is facing. They need Congress to authorize an increase in the debt ceiling so they can borrow more money, so they can pay their bills. It's that simple. The problem is the Congress is not really functional right now. It's not inclined to do so. And the reason is the Republicans do have a majority of the House and the Senate. I mean, that's, that's well known. But they, the Republicans can't agree among themselves. There are members of what's called the House Freedom Caucus. By the way, this is kind of a replay of Obamacare. Uh, I don't want to get into the weeds in, in terms of the health care debate, but uh, I think a lot of listeners know that the Republicans came into Washington with control of both houses of Congress and the White House. And they go, man, we're going to repeal Obamacare. And they didn't do it. And they're not going to do it because they couldn't agree among themselves. They didn't need Democratic votes, but they did need to agree and that they couldn't do that. Same thing is playing out. This House Freedom Caucus says, well, we're not voting for the debt ceiling increase unless we get some conditions. And what about they, they want to defund Planned Parenthood. They want, uh, there's an issue around sanctuary cities. There's an issue around money for the wall. The White House wants you know, money for the wall. Um, and and the, there's a, an Obamacare fix. It's not the repeal of Obamacare, but Obamacare was running out of money. And, and that uh, is a separate appropriation that's got to get through. So there's a bunch of stuff standing in the way of this vote. Now you can say, well, okay, the heck with the Republicans. Let's just get moderate Republican votes and some Democrats. Well, the Democrats are sitting there, and this Nancy Pelosi, right? She said, why should we help you guys? <laughs> you've, you've run us out of town. You've ridiculed us. You've, you've called us every name in the book. You don't want to work with us on anything else. You don't like our agenda. Why should we give you any votes? Uh, even though the Democrats in general favor uh, raising the debt ceiling because um, they like spending money and they like all these programs, uh, they're not inclined to vote for, two, for it for two reasons. Number one, why should they help Republicans? Number two, they don't want all these riders attached to the ones I mentioned. I mean, if you put, if you put defunding and Planned Parenthood in a debt ceiling vote, you will not get one Democratic vote. So it's not clear where the votes are coming from. And um, now let me just shift gears for a second and talk about another event, which is the budget. Now, the budget is different than the, the, the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is borrowing to pay your bills, but the budget is, you know, that, that authorizes all the government spending, you know, that gives rise to having to pay your bills in the first place. The U.S. is on a fiscal year. The United States fiscal year runs from uh, October 1st to midnight on September 30th. And that, that's it. It's like we all, most of us are, you know, December 31st, New Year's Eve. The U.S. government uh, celebrates New Year's Eve on September 30th. This year, uh, September 30th happens to be a Saturday, you know, when, when the banks are closed and the government's not working. So it's really September 29th, which is the Friday. So September 29th is D-Day in terms of keeping the government open. Uh, and you can only do that with a, you know, the atmosphere that, you know, that's, it's a lot of stress and heat and, and vibration and it's got to survive all that. Well, one by one, he's mastered all these technologies and it looks like he's getting to the final two miniaturization, which you mentioned, and, uh, and ruggedization. That comes from testing. Um, but there's one more thing he's doing, and this is where I think it gets very, very dangerous. He's got a submarine, and he might launch, um, there's some reason uh, to believe that he will launch, a submarine-launched uh, uh, ballistic missile. And that's different from an ICBM because you can move submarines around. So the U.S. has been betting on this THAAD defense, terminal high-altitude defense, where we can to some degree of accuracy, shoot down these missiles. No one wants to rely on that because it's not 100%, but you know it's better than nothing. But you can move a submarine to create a trajectory where you're abating the 
had missile batteries, number one. Secondly, you can move that submarine to uh, within range where it would support an intermediate range ballistic, ballistic missile attack. Doesn't have to be an ICBM. So it's, it's, it's a total game changer. And for some reason, I think that's what he's going to do. He also might detonate a nuclear uh, device, a nuclear explosion to protect that technology. That's not a missile launch. That's a nuclear detonation. But any one of these things is highly provocative. So my expectation is that the U.S. will go ahead as planned with this war game that Kim Jong-un had planned all along to do the test, knowing the U.S. would do this, put this marker down to make him look like a good guy. But, of course, he's not a good guy. And that he'll do something extreme if he doesn't, aim a missile in the vicinity of Guam, which would practically be an act of war. Uh, there could be the submarine launch uh, test or a nuclear explosion, and that'll get Trump going again, and we'll be right back where we were on August 8th. So uh, this threat is not going away. Uh, we had kind of a, people dialed it back a little bit last weekend. I think it's coming back at us, and uh, the stock market is extremely vulnerable. You don't have to reach hard to find people who think it's overvalued. I mean, we don't need to belabor that. Uh, I'm not the stock market guy, but go to any, you know, from Robert Schiller to Warren Buffett, to any uh, well-respected voice on that topic. And you, you hear universally that the stock market's overvalued, headed for a fall. And then the question is when. And the answer is, uh, you know, it could be any time it takes a catalyst. Well, this could be the catalyst. So, you know, on top of the terror attacks we've seen, you know, in, uh, um, in Spain on uh, Thursday and Finland on Friday, and there just seems to be no end to it. That was enough to get the stock market heading in the wrong direction uh, the course of the Thursday and Friday. Um, let's see what happens. But uh, I think uh, stocks are vulnerable to this kind of shock. The market has not priced it in. And I do think it's coming probably next week. Sure. So, and, you know, this reminds me of many conversations you and I have had in regards to uh, complex systems, complex systems and critical states. And that really is just a shift of psychology uh, and it's it's just human nature, you know. People, after a while, people become kind of um, apathetic towards things, and it takes sometimes, unfortunately, um, events which would shake people up and, and wake people up, and, and that's kind of what we're looking at. So, moving on to our next topic, um, we by the way, we will continue to monitor what's going on with the with the North Korea situation, and and uh, if there are important updates, of course. Um, Jim and I will probably discuss it again in a, in a future podcast. But our um, our next topic here is uh, the debt ceiling and the so-called government shutdown. So this topic has been discussed over and over again. Personally, I'm kind of disgusted with the fact that we have to do this versus proper fiscal management at the government level. And I know I'm not alone in this. The United States is now sitting on $19.974 trillion in debt. That is $165,851 U.S. dollars per taxpayer. Uh, but it's still a reality we have to deal with on a regular basis now. So Secretary uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has written a letter to Congress asking them to raise the debt limit um, no later than September 29th. Jim, what's your take on all this? Uh, good luck with that. Uh so you're, you're absolutely right, Alex, in terms of the backdrop. But let's, um, let's just sort out for the listener thing for eight years. So this thing's been kicking around since the mid-'90s. Um, and I do think the Trump administration deserves credit for clarity, uh, saying, okay, that, that's it. We're, uh, the, the best line I saw, we're not going to negotiate our way to the negotiations. If you want to come to the table and talk to us, we'll meet with you. And we'll tell you right now that what you have to do is verifiably discontinue your weapons programs. And what you get in exchange for that, let's talk. And obviously there would be sanctions relief and maybe even integrate the North Korean economy into the global economy. They're, they're actually very rich in natural resources. It's an interesting country. They could be a commodity-driven exporter and, you know, have a, have a decent economy. But, of course, they're completely cut off. So now the recent uh, – that's the backstory. The recent sequence of events – let's go back to uh, August 8th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, the stock market went down about 1.2 percent. That's when this rhetoric was dialing up, exactly as you described, Alex. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kim Jong Un talking about attacking Guam. Uh, Trump saying this will be met with fire and fury. Uh, Guam or uh, Kim Jong Un saying, "I'm waiting for the battle plans. We're, we're launching at Guam, etc." Now that weekend, uh, I have to look at a calendar. I think the weekend of the uh, of August 12th and and uh, 13th. 
what happened was a lot of national security officials went on television. Uh, General, uh, you know, H.R. McMaster, who's the national security advisor, um, Rex Tillerson, uh, others uh, gave interviews and they dialed it back. They said, look, you know, war is not imminent. Yeah, you know, by the way, you can't, you, you have to agree with that. War is not imminent. If, you know, if it's coming in, if there's a high probability it's coming in early 2018, is that imminent? Well, not in the sense that someone's going to, you know, launch an attack tomorrow. But that's close enough for investors to start thinking about it if they uh, uh, if they cared, and I certainly think they should. So yeah, I'll I'll buy the fact that it's not imminent. They dialed down the rhetoric, and then Monday, uh, Kim Jong Un seemed to respond in kind. He said, "Well, I've got the battle plan, but I'm not ready to launch it." So that seemed, you know, by at least by his standards, a little bit conciliatory. And then Trump made a statement saying. Um, well, you know, we, we welcome this, uh, not thaw, but, you know, we welcome this progress and maybe we can, there's some basis for talking. So all of a sudden, you know, stocks take off. It looks like the threat's over. Everyone's dialing it down. That is not how I read it at all. If you actually look at what Kim Jong-un said, he said, I will not launch a Guam if the United States engages in acceptable behavior or maybe state of the negative if they don't engage in unacceptable behavior. Um, that was a very sp specific reference to a joint U.S.-South Korean military exercise that is conducted periodically. It's a big one uh, that they're going to launch on Monday, August 21st. And you know these military exercises. They have very long uh, uh, you know, engagement periods. They, and this one lasts for uh, about a week, I think, August 21st to 28th. Has a lot of moving parts, you know, all, all branches of the military. So what Kim Jong-un was saying is, I won't launch a Guam if you call off that exercise. That's what he meant by the U.S. not doing anything, you know, engaging in bad behavior. You don't have to read between the lines very much to see that's what he meant. Well, we're not going to call off the exercise. The U.S. is not going to be bullied. We're not going to be threatened. This exercise is long planned, and, um, and we're going to go ahead and do it. So the minute we do, we have now broken uh, the condition on which uh, – Kim Jong-un was refraining. So my expectation is he will test one of these systems. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. You talked about the miniaturization, Alex. Um, there are actually a lot of technologies you have to master to be able to do this. Um, you know, you have to get your hands on, uh, you have to get your hands on uranium uh, or plutonium. You have to enrich it. That's very demanding technologically. You have to build missiles. That's demanding technologically to have a certain range. Then you have to uh, miniaturize uh, the the warhead so you can fit it on the missile. A, a nuclear device that would just detonate and, and create a chain reaction and be a nuclear explosion could be the size of a truck. Uh, that's called a device. It's not necessarily weaponized because it's hard to deliver, but you get a sm small enough. And then finally, you've got the, what's called ruggedize it, which means that, it, I mean, these missiles go into space and they, the ICBMs do. And when they come back 